of not withdrawing anything of what I've been saying. Uh, but one needs to be aware of how one says it, how one mediates it, and how one explains that what we're talking about is precisely aiming for the same fundamental hopes and ideals of a free and prosperous, emancipated and, and pleasant human condition. Welcome to An Architecture, Episode 12. This is the fourth and final episode in our series about Patrick Schumacher, the director of Zaha Hadid Architects. In Episode 9, we introduced Patrick and talked about a controversial presentation he had given at the World Architecture Forum on the topic of London's housing crisis. Then in Episode 10, we reviewed some of the media responses to that presentation and offered some defenses of some of Patrick's ideas. In the previous episode, Episode 11, I had the opportunity to interview Patrick at his office in the Zaha Hadid Design Gallery in London. And for that interview, we kind of put the whole housing issue to bed and focused instead on Patrick's extensive work in architectural theory, comparing some of the challenges of promoting an avant-garde architectural theory with similar efforts of trying to spread radical libertarian political ideas as we do on this podcast. If you haven't listened to that episode number 11 with Patrick, then this episode probably isn't going to make a whole lot of sense. So I suggest going back and listening to that first. If you did listen to the interview, there might have been a few things in there that went over your head on the first listen. Patrick's a really thoughtful guy, and there's a lot of dense information packed into some of his responses. So we thought it would be worthwhile to take a little bit of time here in this episode to clarify and highlight some of the points from the discussion. Joe, as somebody who's not an architect and I don't think very familiar with architectural theory and possibly architectural history, um, what did you think about it? I thought it was great. I mean, I've listened to it two or three times now, and I think I still pick up new things each time I go through it. Patrick certainly has a very deep and broad body of knowledge. You can tell that he's put a lot of thought into all of these ideas. And he certainly has some, I think, unique perspectives. Yeah, and as you heard, he just rattles his stuff off, like post fortis Network Society. and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't have a poor political vocabulary <laughs> or architectural <laughs> vocabulary. I definitely had the dictionary out for this one. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I feel like we should, as part of this episode, do like a Patrick Schumacher vocabulary workshop or something. <laughs> <laughs> Just have a glossary on the show notes page. <laughs> we'll clear up some of that stuff as we go along here, because I think that there are some really strong underlying ideas. He's written a lot about some of this stuff. And so uh, some of these phrases that he throws around are very familiar to him. And as I've been reading through a lot of his writing, I've come to understand a lot of it as well. But I think that we can break that down a little bit here for people who are new to it. One thing that I appreciated was the brief history of architecture, because like you said, I, <laughs> I haven't really studied any of this stuff. Um, it's something that I've wanted to cover on the show, and maybe we will in the future do a show about historical architectural eras. And just as a general reference, I mean, I think I would personally benefit from that, and I'm sure some of our listeners would as well. But it was good to get his perspective on some of the key developments throughout architecture. So he started with Alberti in the Renaissance, who I'd, I'd never heard of before. And to be honest, I, you know, I, I had no idea that that was, I guess, the first architect. I mean, is that kind of commonly accepted or is that his own? Yeah, that's actually so. So part of the reason we got into the history or that he did is that this is something that he has written about. And he has a couple of, I think, unique contributions to, to this understanding of architectural history, the styles of architecture, as well as theory. The first is what you just said, that he identifies or defines architecture as the practice that developed when you had architects essentially starting to practice separate from builders, from master builders. So throughout a lot of history, you had buildings being built in what he called tradition-bound building. It was you know, craftsmen, tradesmen, um, understanding how to put buildings together. And of course, there was design behind those buildings, but there wasn't a broader discussion and discourse about design separate from the act of building itself. And so for Patrick... He doesn't view that as architecture. They're kind of, I guess, historical artifacts that then come to inform the discipline of architecture once that is culled out from the broader exercise of creating buildings. And he identifies the Renaissance with Alberti's architectural theory as being the first time. I mean, there, were, there was Vitruvius and there were other theoreticians before that, but I think this is a time when he thought that it really took off as a profession. All right, so it's probably a bit like there was economic thought before Adam Smith, but it was never really formalized as a science pretty much until 
Adam Smith more or less popularized it and the classical economists. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good analogy. The other contribution Patrick has made to understanding the history of architecture and theories place in it is that he's connected styles of architecture to stages of capitalism. So, for example, he views some historical styles, such as in the Renaissance or Baroque periods, as reflective of monarchism or, or the dominant political and, and economic conditions of the day. And then that change with modernism, which he describes as a response to what he calls the Fordist society, which is this term Fordism comes from, a, I think it's a branch of Marxism, that's essentially looking at historical stages of economic development or of economic conditions. And so Fordism is viewed as a stage named after Henry Ford, which as Patrick talked about a bit, has to do with mass production and to some extent a democratization of economic progress, but in a way that kind of mass produces people or standards of living. So as Patrick said, modernism was in many ways reflective of and supportive of that kind of a society. And historically, this ties into the progressive era in the late 19th and early 20th century, where you had the rise of democratic nation states, as well as a real drive to use science and technology to drive efficiency. And so a lot of the forms that you see in modernism, I think, are probably driven to some extent by efficient building methods, where they're stripping down all the, the ornamentation and decoration and just building these concrete boxes. Yeah, that's part of it. Modernism was promoted as an international style, with the idea being that you could reproduce similar types of buildings anywhere in the world, and that they could serve the same purpose and, and I guess, essentially have the same value. So yeah, again, it is reflective of this concept of mass production. So then he uses this term, post-Fordist network society. Is that his term, or is that a commonly accepted thing as well? Well, post-Fordist is not his term. That comes out of this school of thinking about Fordism and what they now call post-Fordism which, as Patrick described, is essentially the end of that system of industrial mass production. Not that we don't have mass production anymore. But as he said, with the microelectronic revolution, now with computers and more automation, we don't have as much of those static kind of manufacturing streams with everybody kind of working and producing in lockstep. The post Ford society is characterized, as Patrick said, by much more flexibility and fluidity of labor and resources. And he describes it as a network society where it's, it's become increasingly important for everybody to be connected with everybody else. And is it fair to say that we're not quite there yet? I mean, it seems to me like describing a society that way, especially when you're talking about a decentralization of the means of production. I mean, obviously, there's still a lot of mass production that occurs, but there are these sort of developing trends towards stuff like the maker movement, where you have people producing almost more boutique goods you know, in the garages or whatever, or in small workshops. And because some of the capital required and technologies are becoming cheaper and more widely available, you could see this decentralization broadening much more in the coming decades, especially with technologies like 3D printing. Yeah, and this is true, I guess, of any of these uh, economic epochs or eras. Fordism and its architectural style of modernism got its start in the early 20th century. But you didn't really see mass acceptance of modernism until really probably the 60s and 70s, when it really hit its stride and started dominating urban environments. So yeah, I think that this condition of post-Fordism is just going to continue to progress and increase societal conditions such as flexibility over stability, interconnection over isolation, and ultimately entrepreneurial approaches rather than command and control approaches. Yeah, and as far as the architectural styles go, it seems like this sort of a more networked society could go one of two directions, or maybe both. And Patrick discussed this. One is what he called the deconstructivism, or I guess I don't quite get the difference between deconstructivism and postmodernism, or is it two sides of the same coin? <laughs> no, they're, they're stylistically, they're very different, but I, I guess you could say that deconstructivism is kind of a postmodern response. <laughs> yeah. Postmodernism came along in the 1970s and 80s, and it was very critical of the kind of sterility of modernism that we've described. It started to try to reinvigorate architecture with regional influences, with cultural influences, with literal imagery about building typologies, where you have buildings shaped like people expect a certain type of building to be shaped like. Right. So this is almost getting back to the tradition-bound kind of design, I guess. Yeah, but it was more thoughtful than that. It was more, it was a bit more expressive. There was still some kind of abstraction of, let's say, you know, you might have a court building that might have 
a colonnade out in front, but the columns wouldn't be the typical neoclassical columns. They would be a, a more of a geometrical, idiosyncratic type of appearance. Right. So then what's deconstructivism? Deconstructivism was a, a much more radical type of style. It was almost kind of like the punk rock of architecture. <laughs> <laughs> it was about looking at this rigid order that modernism had created and literally smashing that up. So you'd have buildings with you know shards of walls and windows and roofs and floors kind of going in different directions. It was about breaking down the, the separation even of spaces so that you have a lot more interconnection of spaces. So it really, you know, as, as the name suggests, deconstructed the elements of architecture. So it took the roof and the walls and started to set them apart from each other so that all the various elements that make up a building become separately expressed. So as a style, it was pretty provocative. And as Patrick said, it started to address the kind of complexity that you have in this post fordist society. But what it lacked was a sense of order. It seemed to kind of make a mess of things just for the purpose of making a mess of things <laughs> without really being able to tie the whole thing into, as, as Patrick calls it, a legible whole something that people can understand and navigate. Okay, so now I have a better understanding of what the architect of the House of Doom was all about <laughs> back in episode five. <laughs> yeah, who knew that as the building was falling apart around you that it was evolving to be an architectural masterpiece of deconstructivism. <laughs> Maybe that was the original intent of the builders 50 years ago before deconstructivism was a thing. Yeah, postmodernism is about dynamism. So there you go, you had a dynamic deconstructed house. It was definitely dynamic. <laughs> So I want to get back to the point that I started to make, which was comparing, I guess, either postmodernism or deconstructivism against parametricism as something that's more fitting to this more decentralized network society. Because as you said, the deconstructivism, obviously, it's completely wide open, leaves a lot of room for possibility. So you could certainly see that tying into the idea of a, of a more diverse society. But what I got from the interview was that parametricism aims to keep the flexibility and adaptability of something like deconstructivism to you know, very diverse needs, but also to bring in more of a cohesive, overarching kind of vision to a project. Yeah, Patrick sees parametricism as giving the kind of complexity that deconstructivism started to address. You can achieve that same kind of complexity and interconnection of spaces and functions within parametricism, but he sees it as giving order to this overall complexity. And one of the keys to that is by using curvature so that you don't have these aggressive kind of shards of buildings coming at you as you're going through it. The curvilinearity tends to allow spaces to wrap into each other and to pull the occupant through the space and offers a continuously changing appearance of the building that gives it a kind of visual interest that isn't static. You know, there's not just one snapshot of the building that you take. Your perception of the building changes as you move through it. So I did a drive-by shooting of the, I think it's the Guggenheim in Spain. Yep. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that I was on my way to the airport running late for the flight, but felt that I was obliged to at least stop out in front of the thing and take a photo <laughs> on my way there. <laughs> um, so I didn't get to go in and, and look around or anything. But I mean, that's obviously, that, that was, uh, was it Gary that designed that? Frank Gary, yeah. Yeah. That's something that has a lot of curves and interesting shapes. Would that be considered some, some sort of parametricism or is that something else? Yeah, I think that it's certainly in the spirit of parametricism. And when Patrick talks about parametricism, he's not just talking about the work of Zaha Hadid architects. Right. He kind of evolved his theory of parametricism based on a school of thought within kind of avant-garde architecture that was developing these concepts. And so, as he said, you know, in the 90s, you had people starting to develop computational design techniques where they were starting to generate forms of buildings based on algorithms. And that enabled these very fluid kind of sculptural, curvaceous forms, not just to be conceived, but actually to be constructed. And Frank Gehry, I think, especially with that Guggenheim project in Bilbao, Spain, really put this on the map. But there were a number of other firms that were exploring these kind of formal ideas and trying to find ways to build them. And of course, Zaha Hadid was one of them and was really one of the, the thought leaders in this field. So Patrick tried to essentially give this a name. <laughs> he recognized that there was a commonality and a set of shared values that were driving these kind of explorations. And he tried to formalize that with his theory of parametricism. So a guy like Frank Gehry might not use the word parametric to describe his work. I'm not sure if other people who are working in this type of style have necessarily adopted that word. But I think that Patrick would see that as belonging to the style of parametricism and reflective of some of those values. And the ideas of parametricism are something that appeal to me because 
it's pretty common in engineering to try to design things so that you can narrow the design down to a few simple parameters and then whatever you're designing kind of comes out of that. For example, when I'm estimating a power station, I might be able to plug in how many megawatts I need, how many generators I'm going to use, and stick it into my spreadsheet. And if I've set it all up right, then with just a few kind of key numbers like that, it can spit out a whole power station for me. And I think there's a similar sort of approach with parametricism in architecture, where the architects aren't necessarily sketching out every line or every curve that they're drawing, but it's almost more like writing a program which is going to spit out this building. I mean, is that, is that a broad strokes view of how it works? Yeah, I think that's exactly how it works. And I think that's how it needs to work because the complexity of these curved forms, which are curving in multiple directions, there's really no easy way to represent that other than by generating it computationally. And as you said, this can be kind of tuned to any number of parameters that are influences on the design process. So I'm not sure if the term parametricism, I think it kind of has a double meaning here. For one, it is reliant on input parameters, but it also more simply refers to this parametric geometry or parametric mathematics, I guess, that are used to generate these curvatures on a computer, which you probably know more about than I do. Yeah, and well, again, from engineering, where we might see something that's a parametric curve is in something like a, a thermodynamic chart where you have temperature on one axis and pressure on another axis, and there's all these kind of interesting nonlinear curves that represent different contours of the volume that you get or of any number of other thermodynamic properties. And another place you might see parametric curves is on something like the result of a computational model. A key feature of parametric graphs, to use a fancy mathematical term, is that they're not bijective. One thing that this means is that you can have multiple y values for a given x value. So instead of just having a straight line or something like a parabola, which only has one y value for every x value, you can have something like a circle. It's probably the simplest form of a parametric curve. So if you think about a circle, it's a two-dimensional shape, but it can be defined by only one parameter, which is the radius. And in parametric geometry, you'd set up relationships between the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate on a plot that both relate back to the radius, so that when you plug in a number for the radius and apply this rule to it, the shape that it results is a perfect circle. And so by defining rules and relationships and dependencies like this, you can reduce the number of parameters that are required to define a shape. And more complex shapes, like an ellipse or something that Zaha Hadid might dream up, could have a combination of additional parameters or more complex rules and relationships. In fact, the mathematician John von Neumann once said, with four parameters, I can fit an elephant, and with five, I can make him wiggle his trunk. <laughs> <laughs> and the point there is that the more parameters you add to a mathematical model, or a, he's talking specifically about a curve fitting exercise where he's trying to match some mathematical relationship to data, and generally, the more parameters you use, then the easier it is to fit data. But what he's implying there is that it can actually lose some of its meaning if you rely too heavily on a lot of parameters. And in scientific modeling, and this sort of big data analysis in particular, too many parameters like this can mean that the model is fine-tuned or over-calibrated to fit the specific data that you have, especially if the parameters themselves are poorly defined, for example, some sort of generic scaling constant or something like that that you apply to get the curve to just line up perfectly with the data. But what can happen is if you've over-calibrated a model like this, and then you try to use that to forecast against some new data, it can end up being way off because it was really only matched to the existing data you had and wasn't actually representing the real underlying mechanism. Climate change regressions. Now, I don't know how many parameters someone like Patrick or Zaha Hadid Architects would use in building their models or their designs. But I'm actually thinking that in this application to architecture, this could be almost more of a feature rather than a bug, especially if the parameters are more carefully defined. And what this would mean is that that particular design, which is located in a particular place, is fine-tuned to the context of that place. And what I mean is that that particular building design isn't going to be applied anywhere else besides that exact location. So in this case, you almost want to have as many meaningful parameters as are relevant to capture the context that you really want and to make sure that the building matches that context. Yeah, and I would say that I'm not sure to what extent using parameters as a set of inputs is seen as, I guess, deterministic, you know, that, that they're relying on just those inputs to determine the form. I think that defining this set of curves and gradients and things that make up the composition of their buildings, they're probably looking at parameters 
as more of an inspiration or an influence rather than as a more deterministic approach. Yeah, and I should also qualify that having a lot of parameters in a model isn't necessarily a bad thing. I think the problem with a lot of macroeconomic modeling is that they don't and really can't have enough parameters to accurately represent the actual complexity of the system that they're modeling. And Austrian economists take a lot of flack for renouncing the use of mathematical models in their analysis. And this is really the concern that underlies that, that if you take this really simple kind of Keynesian model or even a more complex dynamic model, you're still working with these large aggregates and oversimplifying because you can't really measure the key driving forces behind that economic action. There's a parallel there between efforts by economists to model and predict future economic activity and the task of architects who predict how people will occupy and interact with the buildings and spaces that they create. And in both cases, the critical thing to keep in mind is that ultimately the desires of individuals, whether it's how they want to act in the economy or how they want to use the spaces that they occupy, are individualistic and are subjective and generally aren't even known to those individuals until the moment at which they act. This is the main point Austrians make about the difficulty of prediction, is that there's not some way to objectify what are subjective wants of individuals. Of course, you can get out to much more complex curves, such as fractals. And that's actually somewhere that I could see parametricism going. I don't know if architects are really using fractal designs at the moment. I, I suppose maybe there's some aspects of self-similarity where you might have a certain curve on the outside of a building, then smaller versions of that curve inside the building. But I could see it, especially if you're expanding out to more of a, a whole urban environment, more of a fractal sort of development, which would have a lot of complexity, but would still be dependent on these underlying rules. And with this self-similarity of fractals, it happens in a couple of different ways. I mean, one is that you have these structures at a certain large scale, and as you zoom into a smaller scale, you can see very similar structures that look almost identical to what you saw at the larger scale. However, another aspect of that is that at that smaller scale, you have many other similar structures that exist that look like that same structure at that small scale. And when you look at a city, you see the same sort of thing, where you might have neighborhood blocks that fall into similar sort of patterns in different areas of the city. So each one of these neighborhoods might have the corner store and a laundromat and a certain other amenities, and they might have similar styles that pop up in different areas of a city. For example, three-story brownstones in different parts of Boston or Manhattan. So this is something that obviously it hasn't developed under a conscious effort to create these kind of self-similar structures or styles. But you can see where it could be done with a bit more intention, and it seems like parametricism is one way to bring that about. Yeah, you're essentially talking about a kind of order that is generated from complexity. You know, a lot of this relates to ideas of chaos theory, where we look at events that seem to be chaotic and non-causal and unpredictable, and yet they can be studied and you can find rationalities or order within the way that these things come about. And fractals and other forms of chaos can often develop from some very simple basic rules. For example, the Mandelbrot set, which is probably the most famous fractal, that sort of cardioid heart shape fractal that people are probably familiar with, that's generated from a very simple equation that has a couple of complex variables in it. Yeah, right. And so I think that that kind of generation of form from a set of initial parameters or variables is what forms the basis of parametricism, or at least the kind of form generation that happens in parametricism. They're taking variables that might have to do with aspects of the site or of the surrounding urban context or of the building program, or you know, thinking about things like patterns of movement through the space, especially if it's a public space or like a, like a transportation hub, as well as things like environmental design, you know, designing for solar orientation and massing. And so as I understand it, they're able to take a number of these variables and factors and use those with a series of algorithms to start to generate some of these forms. And this might be where Patrick and, and Zaha Hadid differentiate themselves from someone like Frank Gehry. As I understand it, Frank Gehry's process is more of kind of like a sculptor, you know? Right. I've seen pictures of this studio where the, it's just littered with all of these models of different iterations of a building where they, they mass it in a certain way and then they start to carve away and start to push and pull and shape these forms. Um, until they get to the final design. And they're working with the, with the computer there. They actually take physical models and they have a way of digitizing them, scanning them into the computer 
and then pushing and pulling the forms within the computer and then regenerating the physical models to for further study. All right. So it's this really interesting iterative process. And I'm sure that Zaha Hadid Architects has a similar process. But my understanding is that with Patrick, I think there's an effort to really have these forms be generated from some meaningful set of parameters about the project. And that's where he sees his style as being meaningful within an urban context where you can have multiple architects at separate times coming in and developing buildings. And as long as they're making efforts to generate their forms based on some parameters that relate to the context around them, then we could expect that there would be some legibility and order to the broader urban forms that develop as all of these buildings start to relate to each other within this curvilinear language of parametricism. Yeah, I liked his term, garbage spill urban organization, <laughs> yeah. for the sort of development that currently exists in most modern urban developments, where it's essentially a hodgepodge of different styles, different purposes, all thrown together because it's all been done independently by different developers at different times, each having their own ideas about what they wanted to build, and probably also each being restricted somewhat by zoning or other legislative requirements. Yeah, this garbage spill urbanism phenomenon, Patrick actually has a paper he's written where he shows photos of some different cities, and then the next photo of the city has a picture of a garbage heap. <laughs> and you look at them together, and, and you see kind of the, the comparison there, that there's variation within the garbage heap, but overall, the whole thing just becomes kind of like white noise. Right. That the individual unique buildings just get lost within the variety of everything else. There's variety, but there's no order. And I think there's a relationship there to kind of libertarian laissez-faire ideas, where there's this idea that if you don't have a central plan or orchestrating development, that this is what you're going to end up with. You're going to end up with individuals working in isolation, doing whatever they want to do on their site, and ignoring the context around them and its meaning to everybody else in the city. And I think there's some truth to that. But then you have to ask, well, what's the alternative? The alternative is essentially these kind of mid-century modernist master plans that solved the problem of context by obliterating it. <laughs> they would just take a whole neighborhood and hit the delete button and put in their composed, segmented, repetitive idea of what the city should be. And something like Brasilia in Brazil is probably the ultimate example of this. And in the absence of that kind of top-down modernist reorganization of the city, we've seen the result. So it's not that we have a lack of central planning nowadays. This garbage spill, as Patrick describes it, has resulted in an environment of what in many cities is very restrictive central plans and restrictions on what can be built and how it's built and what it looks like. And the bottom line is that that just hasn't worked, at least if the goal is to provide some kind of congruous, ordered urban appearance. I was talking about fractals before, and, and I think we can relate this back to that. You could think of modernism as being sort of a perfect circle on a graph or some sort of perfect clean shape on a graph where you understand exactly what it is and it's very easy to see that there's some intent behind it. And then there's another extreme where you could have just a series of random points spread across a graph. And that's kind of like this garbage spill urbanism where it's more chaotic. And there's one thing that's common to both of these forms is that they both lack complexity because the circle is very simple, but the noise is simply just noise. There's no actual information there. But something like a fractal or a more complex shape is somewhere in the middle of those. And this is really the only kind of shape that can express complexity in an ordered and understandable way. So obviously this would be some sort of a parallel to the ideas of parametricism, or at least the goals that parametricism aims to achieve. And so that's what Patrick is trying to resolve with parametricism, is that he believes that parametricism on the urban scale can allow for the kind of individual degrees of freedom, he calls it, for the development of unique buildings, each on their own site. However, designers working within the framework of parametricism could be expected to have a more rigorous way of responding to their context and thus creating buildings that are unique in and of themselves, but that create a kind of harmony with the other buildings around them. So I think what a lot of people would struggle with here is how do you actually get people to follow these rules, especially in a voluntary way, without using some sort of top-down mandate that these are the set of parameters that we're using for this neighborhood or whatever. So I see two challenges here. One is how do you decide which parameters or rules are the right ones for a given neighborhood or city? 
I mean, for a building, it's probably easier to narrow it down because you've, you've really only got one owner of that building. So it's, it's understandable how you could have a few key parameters that would drive the design of a single building or of a development that's owned by one developer. But for a diverse neighborhood where you have multiple owners or multiple developers, how do you get these guys all to agree on a certain set of rules and then incentivize them to actually adhere to those rules? Well, I think Patrick made a good analogy to the sciences where, you know, it's not like Einstein came out and said, okay, guys, I just figured out how gravity works. This is what we're all going to believe now. (laughs) (laughs) He came up with an idea that was convincing and that other people were able to adopt and then to develop further. And that's essentially what would need to happen here is that the style would need to prove its worth and prove its value to people so that more and more designers begin practicing in this way and more and more clients become accepting of that style and desire it and demand it for their projects. In some of his writing, Patrick has made a point that part of the reason that we're stuck in this kind of mess of historicism and historical modernism without a clearly dominant style that represents a post fortis society is for people to be able to perceive the kind of complex order that exists in a post fortis society as compared to the simple kind of order that exists in a modernist society. So in other words, it's going to take time for people to understand the type of order that parametricism offers and to appreciate and demand it. You know, I had this thought when I was listening to Patrick's housing presentation, the one that threw him into so much controversy, which caught our attention initially. As I was reading some of the criticism and some of his responses to it, I kept thinking about the movie Back to the Future (laughs) and the scene where Michael J. Fox gets up on stage at, you know, the 1950 sock hop and he grabs a guitar and starts ripping out like an Eddie Van Halen guitar solo. (laughs) And he finishes playing and the room just goes silent and everybody's sitting there staring at him with their jaws on the floor. (laughs) You know, he grabs a mic and he says, well, I guess you're not ready for that yet, but your kids are going to love it. (laughs) Sometimes I feel like that when we're talking about these ideas of anarcho-capitalism and libertarianism. It's like, uh, I guess you're just not ready for that yet. You know, but your kids are going to love it. <laughs> and you can imagine somebody in the 1950s, you know, hearing an Eddie Van Halen guitar solo and how affronting that must have been. Because you can't come to understand Van Halen, you know, until you have Clapton and Jimi Hendrix and Jimmy Page and... And Frampton. <laughs> Right. And then, of course, you had the progressive rock phenomenon in the 70s that went into the 80s. You know, you had to have that kind of preconditioning for people to be able to to appreciate Eddie Van Halen's kind of deconstructive guitar solos. And I think with parametricism and the kind of style and forms that Zaha Hadid architects and others like them are creating, it's a similar thing. And people look at some of this stuff and, I mean, you can go online, look up any of Zaha Hadid's buildings and go down and read the comments. And you'll invariably find people who are just slamming it that they're just you know come up with any kind of derogatory epithet they can to discredit and disclaim this as just kind of blobs and things like that actually i think the term blob was at one point accepted (laughs) within the the parametric community but (laughs) but now it's become kind of a pejorative this progression you described of the development of guitar god history is an example of another term that patrick used which is path dependence what this means is that the current state of the system is dependent on the states that it was in previously And to break this down a little bit, it basically means that history matters and that the present is influenced by the past. So in the development of a neighborhood or a city or really any sort of biological ecosystem, this is a key feature that plays into that development, where any evolutionary process is going to be driven by certain conditions that have obtained in previous iterations. And in a parametric approach to architecture or urban design, you can see how the existing styles and structures can influence the new structures that are designed to share that space. And of course, the architect's role is to decide which elements of the existing context should be replicated or maybe in some way influence their own design for a new project within that area, or which of those things should be rejected and replaced with something new. And so when I hear the way that Patrick talks about this, about people needing to evolve to a a new understanding of order that's more in line with contemporary society, I keep thinking of that phrase that, just not ready for it yet, but your kids are going to love it. One of the things that I had wanted to draw out of this interview with Patrick, besides just explaining the convergences between political and architectural theory, was to take a step back from that and look at kind of the meta discussion of how do you promote these ideas or how do you promote radical ideas in general 
whether it's this avant-garde architecture or a radical theory of libertarianism. This was what had thrown Patrick into controversy with his housing presentation. And over the years, Zaha Hadid and Zaha Hadid architects have faced various forms of criticism, as all architects do, but they've often been put in a position of defending these really kind of unusual or at least unfamiliar forms that their buildings often take. And Zaha Hadid herself was known for being pretty strong-minded and having a strong backbone when it came to defending her design. And there was this narrative that I had kind of observed in looking back through Patrick's writings and presentations about how he's been part of this movement, which he now calls parametricism, to develop a totally new style of architecture. I think I've heard him compare it even to the, the modernist revolution in the early 20th century. And I think that he and others in the movement recognized the importance of what they were doing. And as he said, it, it had really started to pick up steam through the 90s and into the 2000s. But since then, he, he noted the 2008 financial crisis as being kind of a turning point. It seems to have lost the wind in its sails a little bit. Patrick even used the word lonely to describe the state of the field now, that it's lost that momentum. And as people promoting libertarian theory, I think we can sympathize with that position quite a bit. There are these ebbs and flows in the libertarian movement where it seems like things are picking up steam. Recently, it was probably around the two Ron Paul campaigns. We had a lot of people all of a sudden becoming interested in these ideas and starting to take action to promote them. But it still hasn't hit that tipping point of becoming some kind of a mainstream theory or even being something that you can talk about without being shouted down and criticized in the way that Patrick has been. So I wanted to try to kind of shed light on what I see as this kind of personal intellectual struggle both in the fields of architecture and libertarianism, that Patrick has been undertaking. Yeah, and I think the insights he gave here were pretty valuable. This is a guy who's done a ton of media appearances, seminars, lectures. He's published books, academic papers. So he's been putting the word out there in just about every medium there is. And he has a high enough standing within the architecture industry that people do pay attention to him. But I thought it was interesting that he identified the most effective way to spread ideas is simple one-on-one -on -one discussions. Yeah. And what do you say? Tenacious one-on-one -on -one discussions over weeks. <laughs> right. <laughs> and probably sometimes longer than that. I think that's a really great takeaway from this whole interview, especially for people who are trying to promote libertarian ideas. I mean, everyone has this kind of romantic dream that there's going to be another Ron Paul or someone who, who comes out of the woodwork and leads a mass group of people into this glorious libertarian revolution. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the same sort of thing that happens with any political ideology, right? I mean, everyone, everyone wants this kind of easy solution, you know, messiah event to occur and just kind of make everything better. But really, when it comes down to it, the way that individuals can be much more effective is on this kind of one-to-one -one basis especially having conversations with people who are their friends, you know, who they can get into a fight about politics and then still go out for a beer at the pub afterwards and maybe carry on the conversation there. And it's interesting that this is in itself kind of a meta bottom-up solution for promoting more bottom-up solutions. But one of the key lessons here is that this sort of an approach does take time to really take hold. And it requires persistence and vulnerability, as well as empathy, because you're never going to win anyone to your cause by calling them an idiot. Yeah, and that was why I asked the shock value question. I was a bit surprised by Patrick's response about this, the one-on-one -on -one discussion, that that's, that's the most effective way, because he has been so active in other, in other mediums on a bigger stage trying to communicate with people. This question of shock value, you know, when, and libertarians are notorious for this, right? I mean, we're always just throwing these grenades <laughs> into debates <laughs> <laughs> that in some ways are just meant to get everybody's attention. And maybe that's because it's, it's so hard for us to be heard oftentimes in mainstream settings. But while I agree with Patrick that that's not an effective strategy over the long term, I think for some people there can be moments where they hear something that just completely challenges their concept of the world. I think for me that started with a, a discussion I had heard about challenging public education where I had thought, you know, of all the things that you're going to criticize in government, why would you criticize public education? That seems like one of the best things that government does. That prompted me to start digging into some of these ideas. And of course, that led me into other arenas like economics as well. And for Patrick, he mentioned the 2008 financial crisis and finding some of the Austrian school explanations for why that happened as something that kind of shocked his awareness and compelled him to challenge his longstanding notions about what ideas were acceptable. So that was why I asked the question. I think that there can be moments where these kind of shocks can help to wake up a lot of people, or at the very least, spark a substantive debate where previously nobody was talking about something. 
But that said, I would agree with Patrick that, you know, we too are not out to just shock people. <laughs> we actually want people to digest and understand and accept these ideas on their own terms. Thinking about this concept of, of shock value, Patrick said when I asked him about his optimism about the future, that he thought that it might take some kind of another crisis for libertarian ideas to take hold, that people have to really kind of have their nose rubbed in their mess <laughs> before they can... Uh, start to smell the roses of, of libertarianism. <laughs> and I agree that that could be a catalyst, although as we've seen since the last financial crisis, it was more a catalyst for these kind of anti-capitalist movements rather than an awakening and realization and recognition of the libertarian analysis of the problem and more libertarian solutions. So I'm always wary of this idea that at some point it'll get so bad that everybody will come around to this radically different way of doing things. However, I also don't think that type of a crisis is necessary. I think that the kind of change that we want to bring about within the political sphere as well as within the built environment is something that can happen through market-based processes of new technologies and new business models and exchanges of ideas that can radically liberate people and start to show that there are alternatives to services typically provided by governments and that in fact when they're provided by markets that they're better. And these are things that are often kind of innocuous in our lives, you know, something like email replacing the post office or Uber replacing a cartel of licensed taxi cabs. Or any number of alternative education models that you see popping up all over the internet these days over this public schooling system that was developed 150 years ago. Right. So for me, I think what it's going to take, and I think we've said this before on the show, I think that there are three things that need to happen to get to a much freer society, even approaching a stateless society. One is for there to be a broad consensus that the initiation of force is wrong, whether it's by individuals or governments, that the legitimacy that government has to initiate force is not warranted. The second thing is for people to recognize that government does in fact initiate force and that that is the basis on which all of their other actions are predicated, through taxation and regulation which are enforced by threats of imprisonment or through any number of military actions. If we can convince people that this initiation of force is wrong, and that it's the basis of government, we still need to overcome the necessary evil argument, where even if people accept this kind of karmic cost of government, that it's mired in immorality and aggression, that it might still be a necessary means to the ends that people are trying to achieve. So the third thing that we need to do is to convince people that there are viable market alternatives to every single one of the services provided by government. And within the built environment, that means demonstrating how public spaces like parks and roads could be provided through non-governmental market processes. And it's not enough for us just to talk about it and to kind of pontificate about what might be possible. I think there need to be concrete examples of how these things can happen that can start to expire further entrepreneurial action so that non-governmental solutions are demanded by people whether or not they care about the immorality of government. You know, people don't use Uber because they're outraged about the cartelization of the taxi industry. They use Uber because it works better than taking a taxi or a city bus. And so I think as more of these kind of solutions come onto the market, that we will reach that tipping point where they obviate the need for government, where people start to look at government not just as a, a moral sin, but even as a pragmatic sin, where they recognize the inefficiency and, and stasis of governmental solutions. So it sounds like you're optimistic too. <laughs> Patrick said it would happen in my lifetime, so I'm banking on that. We'll hold him to that. <laughs> Maybe when Zaha Hadid designed that factory for BMW, maybe they were able to crank out a couple of DeLoreans in there and give one to Zaha and one to Patrick. So as far as I know, he might have been to the future already and come back to tell us all about it. That would explain some of their designs as these visions from the future. So you may not be ready for it yet, but your kids are going to love it. <laughs>